Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Together, we'll explore and enjoy content and conversations around mastering transitions. In our relations, our wellness, our careers, our families, and especially in our missions and visions. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. It is such a privilege to introduce Diego Perez today, otherwise known as Young Pueblo. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm. Excited to be here. Yeah, it's been a little while since I saw you, since our last uh, visit with Don Umberto, actually. Yeah, was that October? Yeah. Yeah, a little while. Wow, that was a while ago. Um, We are pretty much knowing each other for the last, what, three years? Yeah, I think since 2016. Right? Yeah. And Diego's work has impacted my own greatly. From Diego, I've learned precision, concision, simplicity. (laughs) Uh, Today, I plan to talk a lot about your rituals for writing, your practices, your inspirations, and your beginnings. Great. Um, And then we'll go from there on a few different tangents. But first... Please uh, introduce yourself to the to the listener, and tell us how you got to where you are. Yeah, for sure. So, like Elena said, um, my name is Diego Perez, and I write under the name Young Pueblo, and that's a name that came to me a number of years back. I think back in two thousand twelve, and mm-hmm. it sort of evolved into this bigger meaning because it literally means young people. And once I started meditating, I started realizing that collectively as a human you know as this this human world that we all share we're very young and we have a lot of growing up to do and to me it feels like there are so many different uh wonderful beings and practices that are around today that are helping us all grow up and the work that i'm trying to put out there is you know a little bit of that sort of push into a world that's a little more peaceful and that peace is really really dependent on our individual happiness and freedom. So supporting the sort of um, psychology and spirituality and philosophy of the individual and just trying to get people to think a little deeper. Mm. But um, yeah, the work really comes from a combination of my background in activism and the meditative experiences that I'm developing while, you know, I meditate at home daily and going away to meditation courses. And you go away to study every, what, three, four months or so? Yeah, I actually just came back. Um, I came back, I was away for a month, and I was meditating for a month, and that was um, definitely the most productive time of my life. Right, I'm sure. (laughs) And do you write when you're away? No, absolutely no writing. So this time, I made sure, I told, because I did it, I was a little naughty last time, where um, in the times where I was like pretty agitated because so much stuff was coming up, uh, I kind of fell back into just like writing little pieces in my head, because I go there without pen or paper or cell phone, nothing, you know, so... I spent some time, you know, writing little things in my head and I would just memorize them and then I wrote them out when the course was over and I realized that that was me trying to hide from myself. So this time I made sure, you know, if I'm agitated, let me be with it and not try to, you know, escape it in any way and just really face it. So I did a good job. I passed my own test this time and I really, and I think it really sort of opened me up to a little bit more progress, which was good. Good for you. And it makes me think of the fact that anytime I'm agitated, the first place my mind goes is how can I teach from here? Mm-hmm. What, what can I teach of this learning that I am currently imbibing? Mm-hmm. Gosh, and it's better, even though the teachings are pretty potent of what you most need to learn, you'll, you'll teach quite well. It's better to just let yourself be exactly because I I wanted to have a a real moment where you know I wasn't young Pueblo I wasn't even Diego Perez I was just a being that Mm. was trying to purify himself as much as possible and I knew you know obviously in the back of my mind like you know I have this is the work that I do and I wanted to really sort of know for myself that 
whether I write in this moment, you know, I think the things that will come later will be much more powerful as opposed to writing in the midst of a storm and the things will, you know, have a bit more clarity. And I think that's what I've seen so far. You know, I've only been back for like eight days, seven days or so. Wow. Yeah. You do look very smooth. (laughs) (laughs) Your energy is very smooth. I feel a lot better. Um, Yeah, I feel healthier, happier. My mind is... um, a lot more harmonious, which is good. Yeah. Let's see how long it lasts. <laughs> well, let's see. You're um, writing when you are home and having a normal day. I know you meditate for, I think it's two to three hours in the morning. Is that true? Um, I do one hour in the morning and one hour in the evening. So right. always a minimum of two hours a day, sometimes okay. more, um, okay. but usually just two hours. Okay, perfect. And at what point during the day do you find you are most um, creative, prolific in your writing? Um, usually right, at, right when I wake up. Um, when I wake up in the morning, I sort of check in with my mind to see what's swimming around in there. And sometimes at like midnight, you mm-hmm. know, when I, when I like can't go to sleep or I'm just laying in bed diddling on my phone. Yeah. And um, I'll, I'll open up the, you know, the... Um, the notes page and just start writing some things out but really i think the best things come out pretty early in the morning yeah i find that too my my favorite and most productive creative time and a couple of people are interested in hearing about your morning routine sure yeah so i think it definitely changes um there are times where i wake up and i'll immediately go and meditate um and then there are other times like this morning i woke up and I knew that I wanted to write something new. So I just went straight into it, um, said hi and bye to my wife as she was leaving, um, and then sat in one of the chairs in my home and just sat there for about an hour and a half, just kind of hammering away at this three, four sentence little piece. Right. And it came out good. It came out pretty good. I mean, I think it's, it's out there swimming around in the internet and it's serving people well, hopefully. Do you remember what it was? Yeah, it was about letting go. I'm just trying to take letting go and look at it from so many different perspectives <sighs> yes. because um, there's a lot of depth there. And I think, you know, in understanding it myself and I think, um, you know, collectively as we're understanding the idea of letting go, um, it's just exciting to see how many people are, you know, defining it mm-hmm. for themselves. Can you remember what it was? Not off the top of my head. It's a little <laughs> too long. But okay. I think the main point is that letting go isn't about just you know being cold towards life it's not about giving up it's not about um sort of you know just like saying just like throwing away the past it's more so about going inside of yourself and unhinging and sort of releasing all of these patterns that are inside of us so that we can live in a new way because when we can actually make peace with the past Mm -hmm. a new life begins and you can start actually moving forward in a wise way but um but for sure, I, I can pull it up and read it if, if need be. Let's see how we feel at the end. Yeah. When I opened up Inward, which is your most recent book, mm-hmm. this morning I pulled up page 64, in one lifetime we can be reborn many times. Absolutely. And I posted it straight away. I love the idea of going inside of yourself to do the letting go and unhinging all of the tense uh, holdings that are there. So thank you for that. A couple of other um, sort of questions that are swimming around in my head and also in other people's heads. Um, How, I know the answer to this, but this was a question. How do you remain connected to capital S source? Um, It's interesting. I think, so something that I don't think a lot of people know about me is that I'm very based in uh, Theravada Buddhism. So, and to me, you know, I try not to focus so much on soul, God, and, you know, sort of like the bigger words that Mm. carry a lot of people forward and really help them um, sort of like define what life is and give life parameters, you know, that they can function within. And I realized that my, I'm best suited in delving into impermanence. And that's my primary sort of like thing that I am connected to. So I would I would call that like a capital I, you know, like impermanence is yes. what I'm thinking about. That's what I'm meditating on. And it's interesting because uh, the divinity in life has really 
come to light through understanding and seeing that everything arises and passes away and to literally be able to exist in a way where there's no real holding on. Um, Because sometimes, and I found that in myself in the past when I used to um, think a lot about the soul and things like that, that I found to me personally, like I don't know how other people are understanding this, but I found it like a bit of a roadblock sometimes where that, that word, I would use it in a way to fit all the undefinable things, the things that I couldn't think more deeply about. And I had to do a bit of letting go because there was this poem that I don't know, I forget if it was Hafiz or Rumi, but he said something like, you know, it goes something along the lines that love taught me so much that, you know, I've let go of every idea, you know, soul, God, like, you know, immortality, all these ideas, you're just, you're just letting go of everything. And then it's like this purity and immensity of love that, hits you into, you know, sort of like pulls you into the the unconditioned. The lowercase L love versus the uppercase L. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, right now I'm just um, focusing on impermanence, um, on the reality of suffering and on the fact that, um, you know, there is, you know, the idea of Diego is momentary. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny where... I have a small group of friends and we're all obsessed with the idea of death right now. (laughs) Obsessed. So this is very apt. Now we know what kind of meditation has been the most transformative for you. And just to take that one step further, when did you have the courage to begin expressing this connection to impermanence in your writing? It took a while. I think it took, I think it was really when 2017 hit that I started delving more into change and just um, because I started seeing that so much of our misery was connected to either being ignorant of change or being afraid of it or just trying to stay away from it. Mm. And there's actually so much freedom that comes from being able to understand that the things that you cherish or the things that are difficult about life only have a particular lifespan. You know, eventually they'll be gone. And I feel like that helps with sort of uh, decreasing the suffering and also being able to increase the enjoyment without attachment, you know, because even the most beautiful things or the most beautiful relationship in the world will eventually end with death, right? It helps me be a better parent. Mm. Sometimes I look at the kid and I get so lost in his little, like the color of his skin. <laughs> you know, it's such an ego. It's it's so many different things. And And then I remember, I'm going to die, he's going to die, and I better just enjoy this right now and not take things quite so seriously. Mm -hmm. The meditation, of course, does help. Oh my goodness, we're tiny little phenomenons. It's it's an immense miracle that we even get to hang out together. Immense. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Like that an orchid is growing in, in, in our midst. Absolutely. I have a couple more questions that came in from the outside that uh, I want to make sure that I get to. How The question is, how to get my loved one to begin? That's a tough one. I think that's something that a lot of people go through. I definitely went through that too when you start finding a practice and you start going inward and you start seeing results and you know that someone can benefit from this so much but to be honest i think that phase passes when you really understand that all you can really do is be a role model and when you can really delve into patience and you know because a lot of times um i don't think a lot of people understand that when they cultivate themselves if they're so willing they can share those merits Right. Not only in their actions by being much more peaceful, less harmful, but actually literally through the invisible, you know, literally sharing the merits. Like when you go away to meditate, when I go away to meditate and we're open to sharing those merits, we're literally lifting, you know, this rising tide of humanity. Mm -hmm. And that's one way to support people. But on the actual physical material level, I think really all we can do is be that role model, just be that change. And I know that might seem trite or but ultimately you just, you know, you can't force someone to change, but you can change your own actions and show them profound acceptance and, you know, show them as much unconditional love as possible. I think um, with my family, there's been a lot of progress where they've seen me change a lot um, over the past six years since I've been meditating. And, 
you know, my mom's talking about doing a course. My brother's <gasps> definitely thinking about going to a Vipassana course. My sister has mentioned it in the past. And, um, you know, they'll do it in their own time when they're ready. Yeah. For sure. Um, a couple things are coming up. So one is that often I find that my family, they didn't just need to see my results in terms of uh, sort of following or notoriety. I needed to show more kindness mm. and more respect and less judgment. And I think that's probably those three things are probably the, the finest results of a good practice. If we're trying to get a loved one to begin, yeah, <laughs> you know, more respect, more kindness. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, we are also, I think one thing that I was able to appreciate, especially about my mother is that I was actually blind to her practice that in her own way, she was practicing and growing and developing and, you know, she was really based in Catholicism, but I've noticed this deepening in her interactions are so much more loving mm -hmm. and so much more sort of just like this, just based in compassion. Mm -hmm. And I think because it was dissimilar to what I was doing, I just couldn't see it. And now that I've relaxed and have been able to, you know, just better appreciate her with, you know, a greater compassion, I'm like, wow, I'm like, she's actually, you know, I have a lot to learn from her too. Yeah. We also have this opportunity now to, as we age, get a lot softer. Mm. I feel that. It's huge. I think um, one of the things I kept thinking about as I was leaving the retreat was that I want to be a gentle person. That's what yes. kept coming up was like I kept seeing the really rough parts of my character and these patterns that I had inside of me and how you know, if I were to play them out, they would cause me and other people so much misery. And ultimately, I was like, wow, I was like, I really just want to be gentle. I want to walk through our earth very gently. Mm. And I think that would be one of the best things that I can do. Yeah. I want to do a reading, and then I have a few sure. more questions. <clears throat> I like to open up inward. That's the title of the book, if you're looking to read more. I like to open it up like a bit of an oracle. So I'm just going to, I'm taking a moment with my eyes closed and my hands on the front and back. I'm going to open to any page. Perfect. Self-love is a sincere acceptance of the past, an agreement to make the most of the present, and a willingness to allow the best to occur in the future. And in parentheses, it's signed wholehearted. <laughs> I love that um what it makes me think is how much we've grown up together yeah. and not just you and I but then um you know the whole world and having social media be a medium for humanity to literally talk to itself yeah you know this like constant feedback loop and I really felt I mean I think I wrote that in 2016 that piece and that was you know, so important for people. People were just trying to define what is self-love and not just, you know, going deeper from understanding it as modes of pleasure, but literally understanding it as modes of actual healing and actually being able to cultivate your freedom and move deeply inward and, you know, recognizing your own, your own emotional history that's affecting your present behavior and then being able to find a tool to actually liberate yourself. But it's beautiful that you know, we've come together to define it. And then it's sort of like self-love makes you ask, you know, so how can I better appreciate the present? How can I, you know, boldly walk forward into the, forward into the future in a way where I can be successful internally and externally? And I think that's why the conversation is so big around letting go now, because letting go increases your creativity, it increases um, your state of peace, it increases your calmness, and it really helps you deal with, deal with the difficult moments of life in a new way. Yeah. In many ways, what you said about social media being a way for humanity to talk to itself is something I would like to talk with you about because as I figure out this whole 5G scandal and that we're all going to be covered in <laughs> EMFs any minute now, Yeah. I don't know exactly how we mitigate that. I start to think, okay, you know, my three times a day on Instagram that I've allowed myself, 
are now too much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yet it's such a beautiful medium through which we get to now, affirm each other and love each other and bolster each other, mm -hmm. lift each other up. At least that's been my experience. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I'm not a scientist, so I really don't know um, that much about it. My wife was talking to me about it. I think she heard a lot about it from Luke Story's podcast. Correct. And what I do know is that I remember reading and learning about the 1950s and the 1940s and when, you know, people, the um, scientists here, you know, did the Manhattan Project and first built the atomic bomb. And then they were running these tests and they would like literally just stand right outside the sphere of the actual bomb and they were just like hit with massive amounts of radiation but totally oblivious like even though they had created that mechanism they were oblivious to how detrimental radiation could be to the human body and i think that's just like a trend like this sort of like relationship that human beings have with technology is that we build something and then we don't really know the externalities of that we don't really know you know, what it's going to do in the long term, how it's going to, you know, affect us biologically, you know, it can enhance our ability to communicate, but we really just don't know. So I think, you know, 5G might be something that's detrimental to us. It might not, I have no idea. Right. But I know that when we look back, um, when it's like 2050, 2060, and we're like, wow, man, we had no idea that was going to hurt us. No we idea. had no idea. And that's just part of human history. And I think, we can extend our lives, you know, there's that, there's also the positive side, you know, living now in a, such a technologically advanced society, even though it's pretty out of balance, you know, some people are benefiting and a lot of people are not. Um, there are going to be other things that are going to help us definitely extend life to be able to have really, really productive lives, but it's give and take, you know, it's not going to be perfect, but there's going to be a lot of learning involved for sure. Yeah. And I do still contend that the ways in which we can help each other and support each other via social media is something really sweet and true and real. Yeah, it's so big. It's so big. And I think what I've actually been doing now, which has been fun, um, is, you know, I'll post, I'll check, and I've set a timer on my Instagram, which has been a great feature that they've added. So yeah. I, you know, the moment I hit an hour and 30 minutes on Instagram, it pops up and tells me, and I'm like, okay, I got to cool it. And, um, and then I'll pop my phone on airplane mode, which has been really nice because I know some people who are pretty sensitive and who couldn't even like feel the Wi-Fi and in the air and all of that. And, um, just trying to like, uh, sort of, in, you know, engender and like create an environment as if like I was in the forest right. and really, you know, have a, a high yeah. vibe place, yeah. which has been fun too. If, um, if you're interested, that podcast that, uh, she listened to is actually really very good. I know, yeah, no, totally. My wife is a scientist, so okay. I, uh, I it was um, the Lifestylist podcast, a dear friend Luke Story, and he was interviewing Dr. Jack Cruz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Harrowing for sure, mm -hmm. but it was funny how I listened to that this morning, and then I knew you were coming, and I thought, <laughs> okay, the scales have been balanced. We're good. Yeah, but that's good. We need people like Luke Story because he's he's on the cutting edge. You he's know? digging in. Yeah, and he's he's so great also about just trying to find that balance between, um, you know, what like if there's science behind this thing mm -hmm. and if there's not, and trying mm -hmm. to just like push further, push further. So I'm really grateful to him giving us a little scare. Same, <laughs> same. It has me thinking a few things. Yeah, uh, which shall be revealed. So. Every guest, I ask three questions right around this time. The first one is what in your life needs healing right now? And you can always opt to say, I'll pass. Oh, no, no, let's play. What needs healing right now? Um, I think what needs healing right now is that I feel a very big drive inside me that I want to honor where... I really want to spend a lot of time meditating and serving um, courses. So in Vipassana, we go away to meditate, you know, 10 days, 20 days, 30 days and more. Um, but you can also, you also have the opportunity to serve, which is an immense merit. What literally, you know, you're like cooking for people who are meditating or cleaning or you're sort of helping cultivate that environment, that meditative environment so that the person can, you know, someone can literally meditate for 10 hours a day. 
And to literally serve someone who is actually working on their liberation is one of the most wholesome actions that you can take. So not only will it help advance your practice, but it will um, you know, support someone else in their liberation. So I want to spend a lot of time doing that. And I yes. want to take time off. Um, I don't know how much, but probably like two plus, you know, I wanted to, I really want to dig in and, and I feel like, um, I'm trying to release the tension between my current reality as a writer and as someone who's sharing a lot and being okay with like, okay, right now I'm, I'm out here and I'm, you know, doing this work that I know is supporting people, which is good, a good way to spend my time and being okay with letting that time that's just for me come a little later Mm. um so there's definitely a bit of tension there and i think you know i just got to keep meditating on it and just realizing that it's okay to be of service out here in the external world and that you know my time will come where i can just you know turn my phone off for maybe like a year or two or so and just literally work on my liberation the uh the default world is happy to have you (laughs) we're lucky to have you while we do yeah, no, I'm happy to be here, too. It's wonderful. There's a nice piece on a, uh, a guy who took a month off, no phone. Mm. Really funny, sweet, uh, I think it was in the Times, might have been the LA Times. And you see him sitting in a New York subway, just mm. hands folded, mm-hmm. looking up at the ads, rather than looking down at the phone like everyone else right, is. Right, right. The only person standing out. That's beautiful. It's miraculous. Yeah. So... The second question that I ask everyone is, what is your favorite view? And you can take a moment to answer this because it can go in any direction. Mm. I mean, I just came out of meditating a lot, so I'm sorry I keep going back there. It's you know, perfect. Um, no, this is important. But I think my perfect view or like my favorite view is when... I'm really in a state of high equanimity and I can really, you know, because Vipassana is a practice where you're sort of literally feeling the impermanence of the body. You can literally feel the vibrations, the flow of energy that's rapidly changing and fluctuating and that's moving actually so fast that it looks like you're there. But if you were to dig deeper, you know, it's, it's just a rapidly moving phenomenon. In those moments when I'm, I feel like most in tune with nature and, and, even to the point of disintegration, you know, where you, you know, the, the, the idea of you starts sort of coming apart at the seams and um, the reality of nature starts kind of like coming out of that. And you're just in that moment sort of witnessing like, oh, wow, like, you know, I'm not really real and that's OK. You know, like fundamentally, that's fine. And, you know, when you come out of that and you sort of come back to you kind of you view the world with so much more love Mm -hmm. and so much more clarity and so much more patience that it just helps with everything. And I think those are some of my favorite, favorite moments with being alive. And that's why I want to spend more time delving into nature and seeing what is really real um, because it is just the most healing thing ever. (laughs) The fact that your answer is basically the view from within the body that doesn't really exist. Yeah, with my eye clo- with my eyes closed. So good. <laughs> so good. I was joking with my wife last night and I was like, it's funny how, you know, we spend so much time. We've been together for a while, like um more I think like eleven years. And um we met really early when we were in college. Mm. And I was like, It's pretty cool how, you know, the next few decades we're gonna be hanging out, but all the hanging out is gonna be really with our eyes closed. Right. <laughs> it's true because she wants to do something similar you know she wants to meditate a lot and all yeah. that and but that's fine i mean it creates such a closeness to all human beings and to to everything that yeah, yeah. i'll save the third question for a moment because i want to ask for the one who's curious as to what it actually looks like to meditate for 10 hours a day for the one who has no understanding of what a vipassana retreat would feel like or look like can you speak to that Yeah, sure. So um, Vipassana is a technique that um, the Buddha developed, you know, 2,600 years ago. And the Buddha taught a lot of different forms of meditation. And this is sort of like one of those um, ways to meditate that will take you, you know, through and through, you know, into uh, nirvana, basically, if you take it all the way. And when you go away to a Vipassana meditation course, 
there's three major aspects. One is that you take a vow of morality uh, as soon as you get there, which is um, no killing, no stealing. Um, you like abstain from all like sexual activity, and um, you no killing, no stealing, no lying. Oh, and no intoxicants. Um, so it's a you know you take this vow of morality that helps you sort of it becomes a foundation where you can then build your concentration and then for the first three days when you get there you practice samadhi basically you're um they give you this te- this technique called anapana where you're you know focusing on your breath and your mind just gets sharper and sharper and sharper um once those three days pass you know they then give you the technique of vipassana which is um essentially you know you're sort of focusing on the body and feeling the impermanence of that and you know it sounds simple but it's you know you have it takes 10 days to go away to really learn the technique properly you know i'm not a teacher or anything i just practice Mm -hmm. but you you know just start delving into that impermanence because within the field of the body you have access to the universe and you're basically studying natural law and through that observation of what's real within you the body just immediately starts purifying. And all of these patterns, all of this conditioning that's sort of really been causing a lot of misery and controlling your actions just starts disintegrating and melting away really quite rapidly. And sometimes that comes with storms, sometimes that comes with difficult moments, but ultimately you learn that because all things pass, even this very intense, difficult moment, you know, just just give it some time and it'll go away as well. But, um... You know, you spend, yeah, it's about 10 hours a day meditating. I think my first course when I went, I was probably able to meditate like five, ten, five, six hours at best Mm. and with a lot of struggle. But how is it broken up the day? The day you do, uh, you wake up at about four, like 15 in the morning. You start, you know, you start meditating at 430 in the meditation hall. Mm -hmm. You're there for two hours. Then you get breakfast. Then you have uh break until eight um then you get back into the meditation hall between eight to uh 11 and you have three hours of meditating and between every hour there's a you know you have a five to ten minute break and then you have lunch um and you are you have a break until about one and then you have from one to five you keep meditating another break from five to six which is tea time or time to have you know fruits if it's your first course so you eat you know you you eat a proper amount but you eat a little less they ask you to try to only fill about two-thirds of your stomach because it really helps you meditate a lot better because if you try to meditate on a really full stomach you're just gonna fall asleep you just sleep <laughs> yeah. um and then we meditate again from six to about nine and from in between that from 7 to about 8 eight thirty, there's a discourse to sort of go deeper and all the while throughout the day you're receiving meditation instruction so it's it's literally like a 10 day um you know instructed meditation course where you're they're making very sure that you're not getting lost you know teachers check in with you to make sure that you're practicing properly and um and it's just immensely effective yeah and they have centers all around the world with the same technique it's taught by sn goenka in the Uba Ken tradition, and um, it's wonderful. I'll be sure to include the information for that in the show notes. I can't wait to go myself. Yeah, for sure. It'd be yeah. really fun to go together sometime and not we say will. not say a word to each other. And not a word, <laughs> just be in the same space. That would be perfect. Yeah. <laughs> the third question, what does prayer mean to you? Prayer, oh, um, to me, right now these days, my prayer, Prayer has been meta. You know, I've been giving a lot of meta just like Can you teach uh, us what that is? Um, I can talk about it. It's mm-hmm. it's tough to teach meta, but I am um, but to me basically when I give meta, I really focus in on the harmony and peace that I'm feeling and I just try to give it to the world, you know, and try to give it to as many beings as possible. And I spread it out um, as far as I can. And sometimes, you know, if the mind doesn't feel like it can give, sometimes it's just giving meta to myself and being like, you know, may I be happy, may I be peaceful. Um, may I be free of all misery and and it's um, in, in an interesting way it's very similar to prayer you know it's very similar to like just wishing the best for people and it's just been such a powerful practice and it's one of the ways that we you know we share all the merits that we've acquired and and it is um, really life-changing mm. when you speak about the merits of the practice mm-hmm for someone who hasn't ever 
meditated or perhaps been exposed to Buddhist meditation in particular, explain to us what the merits mean when you reference them. So there are a lot of different qualities that we develop, um, literally characteristics or like virtuous characteristics. And I think one of them is um, like strong determination or having more effort or the ability to interact with each other with uh, loving kindness or um, the ability to be honest, truthful or um, acquiring wisdom. You know, you can just go on and on. There's a bunch of different things that you can really develop that become part of your character and that actually as you continue developing, they help you on the route to total freedom. So when I talk about merit, I mean, I think one of the big ones that I really cultivated this last 30 day course was um, that sort of like those moments where strong determination and energy really meet and where I feel myself getting to a really deep place and then like laziness just kicks in, you know, and I'm just like trying to continue meditating and these moments where like I kind of want to give up and then I'm like, okay, no, 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 I have a little more. I got a little more and I just sort of like push through and then oof, like, you know, there goes another layer of patterns that just like evaporated. And if I had sort of given in, you know, I would have, I would have just come back to the same place later. Right. When he said given in, he sort of like uh, pretended as though he was dozing off (laughs) in his seat, just so you have a visual, just so you have a visual. Yeah. Um, Um, But these are the type of merits that we develop. I mean, I remember um, just my determination when I first started doing the Vipassana courses was, was strong enough to get me through the 10 days, but not really strong enough to be quite productive. Um, and then over time, I've felt that productivity, my like efficiency practice of a person has increased. And um, I think those are the merits. So they're actually um, just like human characteristics. Mm. Yeah. I'd love to read one or two more things if that's cool. Oh, yeah, we're hanging out. Let's, yeah. Okay. I use this all the time. All the pages are dog-eared. Oh, this is my favorite, though. This one has a huge fold, and it has even food on it. (laughs) (laughs) Repeat daily. Notice the stories you hold in your mind. Let go of the ones that cause tension. (laughs) Come on, people. We can do this. The idea of you sitting for hours on end And having that inner dialogue of you can do this, you can push through this, stay awake and, and I I don't want to say grab the lesson, but stay awake and what's the sentence there? Mm -hmm. What's the sentiment? Mm -hmm. Is it grab the lesson? Is it get the teaching? What, what is it? It's funny. I want to first point, you know, there's something that came to my mind when I was meditating this time around was I would check in with myself and I would ask myself, am I really meditating? Am I really meditating right now? Or am I just mind swimming? That was my new term. Or am I just swimming around my mind? You know, bouncing from story to story, from memory to memory, from idea to idea, instead of actually like honing in on the reality and observing impermanence, feeling everything change. And this was like such a good practice for me while I was in there because then I'd be like, oh, no, no, no. I'm just swimming around my mind right now. You know, like I, I, need, totally. to, I need to actually come back and actually do the technique that um, that I know gives me benefit. Yes. But it's um, it's just such a big thing. I mean, we're every single one of us is Steven Spielberg. Like we just make these fantastic movies inside of us. And so little of that time are they actually real or based in any sort of real social interactions or things that are actually difficult. So um, it's so important to be aware of how rapidly we can take a piece of uncertain information and just like make this immense story that gives us so much grief and worry and and let those tensions go because that is literally the cloudiness of ego at work and just keeping you busy and making itself thicker and thicker. Makes me go back to the parent situation where for the one who is a parent listening, Mm -hmm. the moments where you think about your kid going out and crossing the street by him or herself, what could happen? The moments where you think about your kid going to a party for the first time, what could happen when they lay out all the drugs on the table? 
These oh, are, goodness. can you imagine the stories in my mind? And the meditation practice has helped me so tremendously to let go and let him learn and let him be and, and you know, try and prepare him as vividly as I can yeah. for the moment that some bunch of kids pour several different capsules of unknown origin onto a table and start cutting them up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <sighs> yeah, but and... literally to to not let that story get any farther mm-hmm. than mm-hmm. then how can I prepare him and then how can I l- literally just let it go right and he's going to have his own experience he's going to have exactly what happens be the perfect set of circumstances for his growth yeah it's that's that's a tough one I really it's making me think of two things one is like I really commend my mother because mm. I mean, she was just like I mean, her and my father were absolutely fantastic. But I remember when I, you know, like turned fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, and I started really going out, and I started like coming home later, like one a.m., two a.m., three a.m., four a.m., and the patience and also the worry. Like I would see like how much she's like, what am I doing? You know, like what am I even doing out there? What's going on that late at night? And I think it just takes so much bravery to be a parent. You know, it takes a lot of bravery. And the other side was um, my little sister is, she's 21 and I'm 31. So to me, like in a way, I almost felt like I had a hand in raising her. Mm. And I remember telling her um, to just, I just really wanted her to learn from my mistakes. And, you know, I told her, I'm like, you know, you're definitely probably going to try a lot of different things when you go to college and all that. But you know, there are some hard lines that you don't want to mess with. That's and, what I, that's exactly. You know, and yes. I, I let her know, I was like, you know, like all these d- different drugs, like you really got to be careful with this. And now I, I, it was, you know, I probably didn't do it the best. Like I probably, it was like more of like a scared straight type method where I was like, listen, like I know people who've done this and have passed away. Died. Or I know people who've done this and gotten really messed up and are still doing it today. Yes. And then there's other things that you can have more control over. Yes. You know, but um, but also like feeling that angst. Obviously, it's not. I'm, I'm a brother, but um, but that's real. You know, because it's a tough, tough thing to navigate. And the letting go of the result in the end is probably the best thing for all the parties. Mm, mm-hmm. You know, for him not to feel my overbearing worry and grief and story allows him to go out, feel confident, come back, and know that he's going to find a person here who is supportive and, you know, with boundaries, but also is not going to, you know, rail at him. Yeah, right. It's a nice one for the parents. Um, I think lastly, I think lastly, I'm going to read one more, and then we're going to have one last question. This is a long one, and I'm going to read through it because I think it's important for all of us to hear, and it's a nice coda to the conversation. Working toward our goal and simultaneously letting it go may seem paradoxical, but it is the fastest way to achieve what we want. Letting go is not giving up. It is the graceful walk between continuing to put effort into making our preferred reality come true and not allowing our happiness to be controlled by something we do not have. If we remain attached, we tend to feel agitation or even misery. This creates tension in our being that blocks us from fulfilling our desires. Sometimes we may still get what we want, even if we do not know how to let go. But in these cases, we may be less capable of keeping what we want, and it may even cause us more misery because we never address the root of our tension which is our inability to appreciate what we already had to begin with. What do we get when we let go of the past and the future? Inner peace. Realizing peace within ourselves, no matter our external circumstance, is a high form of freedom that allows blessings, miracles, and success to flow into our lives. Happiness and gratitude are attractive forces. Their lack of wanting is what clears the road. Let me say that again. Happiness and gratitude are attractive forces. Their lack of wanting is what clears the road so that new things may come to them with greater ease. It's a nice way. It's a really nice way to think about it. Now, the last question. To hold happiness and gratitude, to hold it like it's our job, is that 
pie in the sky. Is that Pollyanna-ish or is that just smart? That's, I mean, it's, I would go beyond smart, it's wisdom. I think um, it's actually being in tune with nature mm-hmm. and understanding how it functions on the real subtle level. Really, when we have a goal, oftentimes we don't even realize that that goal quickly converts into a craving. And once that craving, you know, sort of wraps itself densely in our mind, we create so much tension around it that even though we may wor- be working with a lot of determination, we're actually, the, the thing that we want is being pushed away. It's just being pushed away because energetically we become like a closed door. And obviously there are, you know, visible things happening and invis- invisible things happening. And when, you know, you can be working towards something, but if you're not sort of energetically opened up to receive it or you're, you know, you're craving it so badly that that tension just becomes literally just little blocks all over you. Um, and I noticed that in my own life often with, you know, as I was growing up writing that book and feeling how the moments of tension when I would really, you know, crave something deeply just made, made all of my goals take longer and longer. And now I'm, I'm really, you know, it's, it's an ongoing practice because the, I mean, the primary mode that creates attachments that creates our misery is this foundation of craving that's really like central to the human experience or not sorry the, but our human conditioning mm. and but as we let it go if we can actually work with something as a goal meaning we can work towards it and then when we don't get it it's okay you know we just keep working but when you know it's a craving when you work towards it and you're just like dang like you know that you're just upset and you're like sort of like wrapping yourself around in anger again and then you know like this is actually a craving and when you have something actually as a goal you get to it a lot more quickly thank you for that craving versus goal Mm. anything else you'd like to add what do you feel like um, maybe we didn't cover or anything you'd like to share I don't know. I think um, the one thing, I mean, if there are listeners who are just getting into delving deeply within themselves and want to go inward, I know like, you know, having something like, uh, like practice you like inward and you're sort of working on that intellectual level. But I really encourage someone to find a practice that can get you into your subconscious, that can get you to start actually dealing with those deeply rooted patterns and start releasing them. And there are so many things out there, you know, so many different forms of meditation, different forms of um, yoga practices, you know, Kundalini, I mean, there's tons and tons. It's it's a, the world is set for massive healing, basically. Um, But what I really advise people is that you wanna find something that meets you where you're at. You wanna find something that challenges you without overwhelming you Mm. and i've said that you know i I try to say that as often as possible because i know a lot of people are sort of entering into this field but you want to find that sweet spot where it's hard enough that you are becoming stronger but not so hard that you're like whoa like that's too much you know and i don't want to keep going but there you know with a bit of courage um i think you'll definitely be able to find something out there and it might be as simple as a little bit of googling you know what can help my anxiety right 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 (laughs) yeah Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This was awesome. Pleasure. Pleasure. Pleasure.